Okay, tonight we're going to have a look at the work of Charles Bird. Now, some of you would have heard of uh, Charles's work because he was Cardiff based for many years. Um, but yes, this is kind of the first kind of presentation in this format uh, that we can think of, of him, um, because he is kind of still lesser known. But you'll see by the end of this presentation, his uh, range of work was quite extraordinary um, on so many levels. So he could offer us lots of inspiration for our, for our work. Um, so let's see, here we go, see if this, uh, we'll move on. So extraordinary, as you can see, this is a picture of Charles when he was 100. Um, and um, he did carry on till he was 102. Um, and on the, you know, right up to the day that he passed on, he was painting and creating, and he still had paint on his hands, as you can see, that it's there. So this is one of his later abstract sculptures, um, which you know he would he, he'd taken an influence from uh, early 20th century art in the creation of it, but he's obviously given it his own twist. But he he sat there in his little bed, sitting Romney uh, Road in Canton, and I was privileged enough to meet him on a number of occasions and even make an artwork together with him, um, and it was absolutely fascinating um because he was born in 1916 <laughs> which is you know incredible uh period um in art if you like from 1916 or all, all the way up to 2018 so he lived through many kinds of 20th century isms if we like but also followed his own path and his own vision right the way through. Um, so what you can see here is a very early picture. A um, little bit background about his early life. He was born in pont um, He was uh, the seventh, the second of seventh children, seven children. So larger families obviously were the order of the day at those times. And that had an influence in the path that he took. Um, when he was 10, his family moved to Barry, and he went to uh, Romney Schools uh, in Barry, which at the time had a fantastic headmaster and a fantastic uh, leader of um, the music and art department. It was actually the father of Grace Williams, the composer. Um, so really encouraged Charles and all the students there to have a fully rounded education. And I remember Charles pointing this out to me. He said, we got to learn, you know, it, it was a grammar, you know, it, it was a high standard of school. He said, we got to learn about maths and English and they got taken even on trips for Shakespeare up to Stratford. Um, but he said, we also learned practical things, you know, metalwork, woodwork, um, as well as cultural elements. So they would, he, was, he played in the school orchestra and there was a school choir that was known right throughout the UK. Um, and they would go on tours and Charles would be part of this. So he had a really expanded education early on. Quite incredible to think of that, you know, um, in these times for, in terms of resources they mustered up in the community and where they took these students. Um, and, you know, you think that was just, uh, you know, you know, in, in, in at the period where there was a kind of Great Depression as well. Um, and Charles kind of remembered that, that aspect. But uh, education was everything, and every, education really transformed his, his outlook on the, work, on, on the world. And it enables him to keep that big vision as he developed his, uh, his art. So this was kind of an early attempt, because um, when he was, I think it was 13 or 14, um, his dad came into the school and took him out of the grammar school. He got into grammar school, so obviously a bright guy. Um, and took him out because he needed to earn money for the family. Um, so, you know, he ended up doing a whole series of jobs, but he did actually do some work for a photographer, which is more in line with his, uh, his you know, evolved passion. Uh, but he worked for the uh, Royal National Institute for the Blind Fixing Glasses and things like that. 
and then he had to go and serve in the, uh, the Second World War. But he used it all, all his mechanical skills in that. So he was working on the bombers and he was working on hurricane um, aircraft. Now I mention this because this becomes a large part of his artwork as it kind of develops later on. You start to see all these different uh, themes and fragments come in together. So this in this early picture, which he gave to his aunt, actually, initially, and she wasn't that impressed with it. She said, I don't want that on my wall. This is what he said to me. You know, I don't want that. You know, give me something else, which he, he kindly did. He was a very humble man. Um, but we see in this picture, you know, uh, you know, an understanding for composition, um, the way everything, you know, draws our attention to the center, you know, the way everything is supported going round and round like I often talk about so that we don't escape the picture. He also includes some little figures for scale um, in the piece. Um, and he sets, you know, an interesting atmosphere by the muted colours that he uses. Um, and it's that interesting atmosphere which kind of evolves in his work. So this is another early picture, as you can see, of uh, Butte Street. Um, these, these are amazing in terms of these bygone times. Butte Street was vibrant at that time and it was international. Um, okay, okay be known, it, it became known as Tiger Bay um, because of all the nationalities that kind of coalesced there. Um, and you can see in this picture, he's managed to give this kind of feel of, you know, the music and the jazz and a slight sophistication from different cultures but also there's a kind of other narrative which is being presented there this could be Charles or the artist walking up these steps to these this fascinating place uh, with a slightly bemused onlooker there um, with a hint of a few other people just looking out through the windows there and there as if something else is just about to happen and it's got this kind of flattened perspective in it these are oil paintings quite dark and richly painted with a lot of uh, varnish and gloss in the medium so they do kind of shine out like little jewels but at this case this time they're flat areas of color which kind of evolves further when he develops now because <clears throat> charles as I said, was he decided to be an artist, a full-time artist, when he was 32. He, he enrolled to night classes at Cardiff. And one of his teachers actually was a chap called uh, Leslie Moore, which was the man that set up the summer school in Barry, if I remember correctly. Now, he, so many people said he was an inspiration in terms of empowering people to uh, develop their creativity. Um, but he exposed him to, you know, the 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 art world and the different uh, uh, artists that were kind of developing all kinds of ideas. So it was big thinking that was uh, being presented. Um, and Charles was in a in a position, you know, as a relatively young artist who stayed in Cardiff, where he didn't have a lot of uh, resources, you know, financial resources. So his subject matter became the elements which are really close to him. So he lived in the Canton area um, and he makes some fabulous pictures of Canton, centre of Cardiff and then down in kind of Cardiff Bay early on. But you see this amazing sophistication in these uh, pictures. This is a winter scene, um, but you know, it's so much more than just a view out through the window. It, you know, it captures this amazing atmosphere, um, this amazing light in the picture, but he kind of uplifts the whole picture with these beautiful colours, these jewel-like colours, um, and put, brings together these really interesting simultaneous narratives. You've got people going about their, their business there. Of course, um, the lady here putting up, you know, the washing, putting out the washing, um, some chap fixing the gutter in there, someone else, you know, chopping down a tree, um, child playing, um, all together in the same kind of picture, a couple chatting, you know, you kind of, 
makes time expand and tells many stories simultaneously, but also brings up an, a kind of a ear, you know, feeling of mystery in the piece. This is winter. It's really dark, you know, up there, but they put out clothes, colorful clothes to dry. <laughs> What's the chances of them drying in the winter? I don't know. You know, there's this kind of subtext, sub story being uh, offered there. So we can ask these questions, you know, painted in these times, which are still quite dark as well. You know, after the Second World War, you know, ideas start to come to your mind about what was going on under the surface. But these little stories which are playing out in this uh, in this scene, in this local scene, beautifully painted and the composition and the structure is is amazing you know um you can see that he's embraced um elements of uh post-impressionism you know bits elements of maybe parts of gorgon and uh, the the pointillists start to evolve here but also abstraction is there flat areas of color um all brought together where we, we just can keep investigating this scene over and over and over um and i remember when i first was introduced to him I think it was in the 80s the 1980s something like that they had some of his pictures up in Cardiff old library which was on the Hayes um, and they were just staggering you know to see them up there and be able to investigate them that's an interesting story which we'll we'll talk about a bit later um, you know this one you know a kitchen in Canton I just you know, I just love it <laughs> in terms of it. In our, our re, art history references, it takes me straight to someone like Van Gogh. You know, you, you think of Van Gogh's yellow room, you think of his, his chair, you think of the bed and those kinds of things there. You think of the straightforward honesty in Van Gogh is being presented in a picture like this. There's the yellow is, you know, really emotive as well. So it kind of, you know, there's so many sim you know, symbols which come from that color yellow being used like that. Obviously the sun and the golden and, the, you know, the light coming through it. So there's a simple joy there. Um, and there's an optimism because the room is looking out onto a garden, you know, where the trees are full, where, where someone might be you know, trying to get apples from the trees or whatever, or, you know, even playing, you know, they're, they're, they're there. So there's an optimism. But there's a sophistication in the kind of way the artwork's being treated. We're seeing elements of cubism being incorporated in this um, because we're seeing multiple views played out simultaneously. Okay, we got perspective, which leads us out into the garden, but we also got another kind of perspective happening when we look down onto these potatoes on top there. They're almost kind of flattened off. These things are all just overlaid almost seamlessly in a in a picture um you know and the thing is charles was work was never kind of really put on a larger stage probably because he never really left cardiff he didn't engage with the london set if you like and they never really engaged with him but he just kept persistent with his with his visit with his uh, vision so he was taking all these ideas on board and putting them in his artworks but uh, they weren't really getting out to a, a larger audience, if you like. Um, but as well as his knowledge of the art world and those different ideas, you've got this beautiful, honest kind of sharing of a narrative and a place and a sense of time. And the beautiful details, like the milk bottle behind the door and things like this, you know, they are of a, a certain kind of era. Which, so they, they work on so many levels. And you can see in this little still life that he's embraced this quality of uh, pointillism, you know, building up the whole piece with a series of dots. But he's done it differently. He's laid down flat areas of colour first, local colours, and then he's put these dots over the top for a certain kind of purpose. Now, why has he done that? He's done that to kind of lift those flat areas and to create this kind of jewel-like quality. So he's put complementary colors and secondary colors together over a, over a ground color to lift it. And that's the emphasis. The word is 
lift in every area as high as he possibly can so it resonates with us um, and when you see these pictures in the flesh you know that happens they have a simultaneous stillness a monumental quality which you see from the kind of structure uh, of the uh, different uh, objects being portrayed but they have a likeness to them as well which is kind of elevates like your your eye gets to vibrate with the beautiful beautiful colors so even in this one you can see how he's using multiple viewpoints um, looking down at different angles but everything once you once you're into the picture it, you know you can't escape from it composition enables us to stay and keep going round and round and round in, in the work um, as in this one you know another view from a canton window in the snow um, it's got elements of the stories he's got those lovely specifics the cat on the wall um he's got the washing out again but there's these beautiful details you know like a little postcard or something on the wall there but it's also a portrait he's got uh, the beautiful still life being used um but also kind of with perspective changed and transformed um yeah in keeping with abstract painting and abstract thought you know if you think of the other contemporary artists at this time i know ben nicholson and people like that they were all about flat portrayal of objects to twist space and time um you know and charles is doing that he's incorporating all those things in the picture um almost kind of seamlessly he's not saying you know that the picture is all about that element he's saying it is just another aspect of it so it's kind of humble in the ways he's kind of offering that but for us if we get the opportunity to look at these pictures we can get more time uh, we can investigate these these different levels to it um, and this is a daring composition you know we get the view through the window well, what has he put right in the center? You know, he put this crossbar right there and it kind of breaks up the view, but it mainly is put in for an abstract purpose because it takes us straight down through the picture. So then we can then wander around the rest of it. You know, it holds the picture together. Every bit holds the picture. You know, you just keep moving and moving and moving. Um, but he's cleverly reduced the scale as we go further back. So we do get this illusion of space as well. So we get this kind of push-pull feeling um, happening consistently. Um, very clever. Um, and this one of Cardiff Market, painted in 1956. You know, obviously those of us who were around at this time, well, maybe not me, but maybe one or two of us that are here tonight might remember this. Um, you know, he's kind of captured a certain spirit and atmosphere in the place. All right, Cardiff Market has stayed pretty much the same for many years. It's a kind of an oasis in the centre of Cardiff. Um, but it kind of evokes this kind of feeling there um, that he's managed to portray. He's got a sense of, uh, you know, interplay between the figures as well which you kind of start to look at them and th ask yourself what are they thinking what kind of dialogues are they having so that narrative aspect is there um, and when you stand in the entrance to cardiff market it's usually pretty dark um, but then you look you're kind of looking into the in towards the doors there which is this, this kind of promise of something better something lighter something richer is just you know beyond reach if you like it's there in the distance this idea of optimism just a bit further you know just there through the doors um, he's got that kind of quality again um, but the use of colors you know they're kind of almost like particularly in the distance they're kind of african or moroccan or there's you know the the design quality is there that you might find in marrakesh you know that kind of element um, all being overlaid so this is cardiff this is on one level a kind of dark cardiff um in terms of the atmosphere and the sense of place and time for some people but there's also this optimism and this hope and this is exotic quality is there as well so again many layers to it um 
And he's managed to do that, you know, lift it all for the backyard in Canton. <laughs> when we think of Canton and we think of the houses there, um, you don't really think of him as having this kind of uplifting magical quality. But he, he gives us this window into this space. Um, the colours in the original are even much, much richer. You know, they are like jewels. Um, but he gives us an insight into the, you know, the quality, what is going on in these people's lives and there's been kind of parallels between Charles and L.S. Lowry and you know obviously Lowry's much more famous than Charles. Lowry portrayed okay Salford area, Charles portrayed Cardiff in its environs um, and it's interesting that that was the case um, and I think you know comment the Carl that Charles makes later in this presentation uh, gives us an insight into why that is the case. So for us to revisit this and see these works now is something that living in this area we should be really proud that they actually exist you know um, and hopefully they will start to get more of an opportunity to be to be seen. Um, so, you, you know, in, I, I just love these kinds of intimate pictures, as you can probably tell from my excitement, you know. The, the structure's so well constructed, you know, it's just so strong. Um, the layering is there again, the colours are beautiful, uh, the insight into, the, you know, what is going on at that particular time sets this mood, sets this atmosphere. Um, and there's a real joy there. And it's, there's a kind of joy which really evolves into Charles' work. And that's what gives it this big, big vision. Um, you know, this beautiful picture in Kitchener Gardens in the springtime. Ah, just amazing. You know, this, the blossom is coming through. But it's such a humble subject. You know, it's not a grandiose landscape. It's not a massive seascape, you know. It's not a great big stately home and it's not rolling hills. It's humble. It's in the Canton High Street, but it's focusing on rebirth. It's, fo it's focusing on optimism. It's focusing on nature. Things got the potential to get better. Things have got potential to reinvent themselves and become joyful, even though there might be restrictions at the moment, like the fences which are running through there, there's the cherry blossom in the trees, you know. Uh, we can still just sit and be in amongst a busy urban environment and appreciate the beauty of the trees, the beauty of, uh, beauty of nature, you know. Um, I, I just think that's such an optimistic and, uh, you know, wonderful kind of portrayal of uh, what, is, what is possible. Um, so it kind of inspires us to, 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 to look and look differently at what we think might be beautiful in our environment as well. And search out these little corners that are often forgotten, which can, you know, spark out something particularly interesting. Give something an unusual perspective. Don't just go for the first big grand view, you know, maybe just look to the left or look to the right and search out these uh, lovely little corners of uh, wonderment. Um, as he's done in this one, this is the allotment thing card in uh, Land of Gardens. Now, any of you that are from Cardiff or know that area and you know been back there, have been around here for a while, know Land of Fields and know this area where the you got this open air swimming pool, uh, which had so many happy rem memories and particularly for myself as well. Although it was freezing cold nearly all the time, but these open air pools were, but it was really lovely. But this shows, um, you know, what happened, you know, after the uh, during the Second World War and after the Second World War, these fields were given over to, um, to this is given over to the war effort to kind of grow food um, and the utilita utilitarian quality. Now that's something that we've always had in South Wales. It's been, an, you know, it's an industrial area, but it's an industrial area, of course, in a beautiful, beautiful natural environment um, with the sea of course and the mountains and the greenery and they've kind of had to coalesce together sometimes successfully sometimes not successfully and Charles portrays these two aspects 
um, of it. Um, it. It betrays how nature is there, how nature gets transformed, how the urban environment takes over elements of nature, but he still tries to offer a kind of beauty and a dual, dual, dual uh, nature um, element of uh, of the landscape there. Hence, all these beautiful little marks that are being shown and portrayed. But you know, lovely memento of time and space and uh, a passing passing era. Um, as in this one, a Butte Park. You know, um, just appreciating the moment of just sitting in the park. Uh, spending time together, in this case with the, with the family, or just reading a book, or sitting on your own in the nature, in the beauty of nature there. Um, it's a kind of universal reminder of what is important, you know. And don't forget this Butte Park, it's in the centre of the city, so it's an oasis that is there as well. So again, it's something that we can uh, appreciate. And you can see elements here in terms of artistry and um you know context pointillism is being used these multicolored dots are being placed but you know there's four vist elements that we we studied you know these flat areas of color which draw you into certain parts they're there as well there's the abstract quality you know shapes composition all there in this beautiful setting that maybe we just take for granted um, and that's something which can easily, easily be done. So it's nice to revisit this. You know, again, another, another humble picture. And it's a humility which comes out, I think, in his pictures, which I th is particularly appealing. Um, this is the Gorsedd uh, Gardens. You know, we know this. This is in front of the National Museum. So Charles didn't do the view of the museum or the elaborate architecture or something. <laughs> he just chooses a little side view, you know, a side view where you could just sit quietly, relax, um, read your book, let me go to sleep, you know, um, but appreciate the beauty of nature and have a hint of the architecture that is just surrounding and just beyond this, this area. Um, it's, you know, that sensitive, and it is a sensitive perspective of just stepping to one side and seeing the beauty to the left and right of us when we slow down, which is being uh, reflected in this work again. Uh, also, you know, connecting with this historical context of um, these sense of places. Um, as in this one, the Sophia Gardens, so many, you know, activities go, go on and have gone on the Sophia Gardens. They've had so many, uh, amazing concerts and shows etc over the years um with which are hinted at there um but he's got the emphasis on the the resting the quiet the away from the crowd you know we're in the center of the city again but he's you know there's that time for reflection um you know interesting for an artist to focus on that time for reflection there so much so in his pictures to tell that kind of story um, because often we're looking for that you know the impact of the scene which is going to be powerful um, but this is a gentle power in this um, and you know to draw people sleeping as well and the dogs and the animals and reflecting um, as well as a certain kind of busyness um, it, it just it operates on so many levels um, kind of evokes some in, you know, real sensitive feeling inside. As it, this is a brewery and paper mill in Ely, uh, West Cardiff, you know, the, the Ely mill and paper mill was a landmark for many years. Um, this is obviously before the houses and many of the houses started to follow all around it. You know, Cardiff had so many canals um, which uh, fed, the, uh, fed the city. Um, and it must have been really beautiful in certain aspects, you know. And, you know, in some way, wish we could have kept um, uh, more of them there. You know, we could have had a, a little mini Amsterdam. I've been a bit over the top there, I know. But, you know, there was potential for that um, because these these beautiful, um, uh, these you know, there's a lot of work to make those canals and they could have been really focused on because they went right through the centre of Cardiff as well, you know, into Queen Street and 
uh, all that kind of that, Mill Lane, etc. Um, so they would mean a real asset. Maybe they will be opened, I don't know. But Charles evokes, it takes us to that. He's kind of showing us the substructure that is there below Cardiff as well. Um, it's just, uh, so again, so many, so many levels to it. The structure of the pattern is there. We move, move around it. Composition is there. Abstract colors beautifully inlaid. The reds, the yellows, as pure color in figurative uh, muted colors, you know, combination of the muted grays which set the scene and the gray blues and then drawn into these strong reds and strong yellows of primary colors that could be straight out of Mondrian you know these primary colors the yellow and the blue so you know he's right up on contemporary thought he's reading these books he's, he's analyzing it he's seeing it um, but uh, obviously the art world wasn't getting it and hasn't quite got it yet unfortunately but uh, no doubt it will um, and then this became a whole body of work that he produced of Cardiff Docks. Um, he was painting Cardiff Docks in the 60s, end of, six, end of 50s, 60s, when, of course, it was kind of starting to go past its heyday then. But um, he, he basically said he went to Cardiff Docks because he couldn't afford to go anywhere else. And he was just borrow his friend's bike, go down there drive down there and then leave it down there so his friend could pick it up and come back the other way. Um, but he was fascinated by elements of the dock, elements of the industry, um, and the boats and the international community that was brought into it. So he's recording what has now become a bygone age, but he was connecting with uh, intriguing communities as well. And I suppose Charles spent you know a num number of years of his youth in Barry, so he had the Barry docks experience with all those people that came to that area he had an understanding of the people that came and why they came and the work they did he also trained in engineering as well as you know developing his art so all these passions kind of come together in why he chooses what he does and makes these beautiful statements these visual statements for us to reflect on um, because he's kind of turned them into, he's, he's turned industry, in this case, into a form of visual poetry, you know, with, with the, you know, as he said, the beautiful pointillist technique and the beautiful pinks and purples and subtle greens that you wouldn't expect with uh, heavy industry, you know, like the, the tanks and the belching out uh, chimneys there. So he's blended all these different qualities, which gives him, you know, gives us more and more richness to discover and rediscover in the in the artwork and they look nice in the reproduction but it's even so much better when you get a chance to go and see them um for that to happen i think he he donated a lot of pictures to cardiff city council if i remember and they did have them up in the west in their dock offices in in is it west canal wharf you know correct me if i'm wrong but they're there but that they should be open to the public, but I think you've got to go and ask to go and see it. Um, but there was also a collection of his work in Cardiff Library for, for a while until they shut it and then rebuilt it and moved it, etc. cetera. Um, but, um, you know, for, for more of his works to be on public collection that, and a way of the public seeing it, um, it would, would, would be a real benefit. Um, and here you've got West Dock in Cardiff, you know, um, and capturing the place and the space, taking us to this uh, this time, you know, when the place, the whole area was absolutely, you know, still buzzing and alive with, with certain energy. Um, and there's a kind of almost like childlike, playful quality in the work here as well, which is kind of coming out of the abstract nature of the way he paints. And he develops that, this abstract, playful element, um, lifting the spirits from that perspective, come out in what he develops in his sculptures later, which he, which kind of got the coin, uh, the name of uh, magical mis mystery machines, you know, magical machines. Um, and he's kind of got them in this. If you look at this, and then when we look at some of his, uh, his later sculptures, you'll see how they kind of blend together. And while one aspect inspired uh, 
the other. You know, there's landmark buildings here. There's the Pier Head building. We got the top of the Norwegian church there. This was before it got moved um, over to, um, you know, where the Cardiff Bay area is now the main center. This is where it was before, obviously. Um, so, you know, it takes us back to those, those old periods, uh, the old tin shack, you know, combined next to, you know, the Pier Head building, you know, beautiful architecture mixed with simple, simple architecture. Um, you know, as in this one of the docks, beautiful portrayal of the reflections and the colours just running through through there, through this amazing technique. Um, quite a textured canvas, as you can see there. So these let the canvas speak for itself up the top. But as you move further down and the paint marks become thicker um, and the oil, you know, content gets deeper, so it becomes a bit more impasto, um, then you start to just get this dabbing of this, of, of all the marks. But each mark has got a size, a direction and a scale. Now that's what's important to remember this if you're interested in this technique. Um, you're going to see, if you look at the way the, the marks have been put on the water, the emphasis is on horizontal. You see the marks here are bigger in size than they are in the distance there and there. So that, that aids perspective. Okay. You see the marks here, which are on uh, the, the, the side of the dock and the greenery, they're pushed up slightly vertically in the direction of grasses that would kind of grow. Um, so the direction is uh, changed. And you can see in the background there, those marks are put on diagonally. Coming out of the smoke and moving across there, it suggests movement. So it's extended movement going across, across the top. So the marks and the way they're put on and the size of the mark is important in this technique over the top of a very strong composition. That's how it's kind of put together for us. Um, in this abstract piece, oh, you know, the composition is just there, um, strongly put together, um, and you can just see the marks coming through and gently uh, sharing, their, sharing their beauty. A flattening of the subject here as well. So we've got some illusion, we've got some sense of space, but we've also got the abstract quality being uh, being used strongly here. Beautiful rhythm in the verticals as well, leading us down to every part of the picture. And this path running through onto something just beyond, that thing about going just beyond again, uh, leads our eye up and, up and through. Um, lovely colors in this one, you know. Um, two bridges. Cardiff, uh, Cardiff docks, you know, references obviously to the industrial architecture of the, of the time. Um, but, you know, someone fishing in the docks, you know, which obviously goes on. Um, it's a human quality there. They're fishing there, they're fishing there, they're sailing in there. So, as I said, these were then as the docks were in the 60s. And so the heyday had gone and people are kind of, reusing them they're changing their kind of use but they're still interacting with them in a slightly different way but we get to see that kind of transition um obviously it'd be very difficult to notice and see these kinds of so see some of these places now because they've been completely transformed by new buildings and flats and that kind of thing but it's still possible to have a tour around these uh, places and see where the different spots where he did uh, paint but how he manipulated perspective and um, composition is uh, is uh, there's a reference there for actual place, but he's changed it. It's changed out of all recognition at times as well. Wow. And then Charles moves into a period in the 60s, end of the 60s, where he makes a whole series of abstract works. Now you can see in his more figurative work, there's abstract qualities. In, or in aspects of it, but he, he then goes purely into abstract. Um, and I suppose this is a kind of spirit of the time. Uh, figuration in art at, the, at that particular time was really frowned upon, you know. No artists of their salt would be working in figuration. They had to be developing ideas and thoughts, and they had to be conceptual artists, or they had to be abstract artists. You know, this is post-American art, the 
you know, Jackson Pollocks and that kind of artist of those era. era. So, you know, Charles is engaging with that time and that place as well as following his own kind of vision. Um, so you get these unusual shapes and these objects being placed side by side and these little playful indications of something beyond time and space um, and unusual creatures and uh, manipulations of uh, figures and that kind of thing. The, the imagination starts to really uh, take off for him here. You can see this is like one foot in both camps. There's reference here to pure abstraction, which is just shape and form. We get a sense of place. There's an ind industrial quality uh, to this, you know, like this looks like a rusty shape. It looks like it could be down the docks. Um, the rooftops of the could be like the docks, but also it's broken into just pure abstraction, circles, rectangles and squares. As I said, references to people like Mondrian or Cubism and all that kind of thing are taken on taken on board. So it's almost like transition between one to the other. Um, and then he starts to make these pictures. So these are three dimensional sculptures now, but then a crossover between sculpture and painting. This is obviously a, a detail of one of these amazing machines <laughs> that he made and for a while displayed in the old library in Cardiff. Pity about the picture quality here, but this was an exhibition in Art Central in Bay that actually was pretty good. And I remember going and having a chat with Charles at this. That is Charles actually there. Um, and he was so pleased that these machines were actually being shown again um, as, a, as a kind of group. And it was a you know friend of Charles called Ken Williams worked so hard to get enable that to happen. You can see not very clearly. These are some of his paintings on the walls on the outside. But I just put this in because it gives you some idea of the scale and the intricacy and the mechanics which are going on in these. All these parts would swing around and they would swirl and they would transform and they would change. They would make sounds. You know, um, you, know you can see in this one. This is a detail of it as well. All these kind of found objects were coming together to make these artworks. So he's gone almost from his paintings and you can see the, the colors which appear in his paintings also appearing in his sculptures to create this kind via his abstraction to create these living moving artworks which are known collectively as kinetic art. Now when he had this body of kinetic art at the end of the 80s he produced that was being shown in Cardiff Library. That effectively was the largest collection of connective art in the UK, maybe even in Europe, but it wasn't really celebrated, you know, but that's what we had on our doorstep at the time with these. And these pieces now, they've kind of, we haven't really found a really genuine home for them. They're dispersed around Wales, bits and pieces, you know, in different, uh, you know, piece me ways, but there's no collective home. Um, and the reason they need a collective home is because they're, they, they're internationally unique. I've never seen anything else like it, um, you know, in, from a global perspective. Um, all right, kinetic art just came about in the 1920s. Um, and you've got people like Nam Garbo and uh, cult, the American artist Calder making these mobiles. So they push on, you know, kinetic art. But Charles has taken that much further and given it so many layers, so many other twists. He's given it a unique South Wales industrial twist, as opposed, because he's, he's made and incorporated um things which kind of uh he's incorporated radios he's incorporated um things which move he's, he's incorporated things which kind of sing out rattle, you know rattle he's, he's kind of used the mechanic element in his art um but he's also given it this uplifting childlike quality although they're definitely not toys um and he's kind of blended the arts of the 19th and earliest 20th century in them so all these elements have kind of come together um, so that's what's unique about them uh, they operate on so many interlaying 
threads of the art world. Um, and the fact that they've emerged out of South Wales is quite extraordinary. And that's just, you know, obviously fair play to, the, to, to Charles himself. Um, you can see to some here, you know, there's one like this little moving robot and this machine that moves around and things which spin around. Um, the transistor radios inside the piece as well, which sing out um, and tell stories and speak music and things like that, all overlaid in the same artwork. Um, now, this is um, a picture that I did of Charles in his bed sit when I think he was about 98 or something like that. Um, and I, I put it in because it gives you an insight into the man in later, into later life. He was so humble. There was a real humility in, the, in his kind of being, his aura, if you like. He was one of the most kind of, I suppose, for want of a better word, spiritual person you could, you could meet. Um, he kind of just followed his path, obviously, for so long. Not many of us are going to get the opportunity to follow our course for 102 years and keep doing it, you know. Um, and he had this kind of vision. But when I was talking to him there, even there, you can see the, the humility comes out by the way he's lit that room. You know, it's just in a saucepan with a light with nothing on it. But all his sculptures, the latest ones he were doing, were all stacked up here, all around the outside, and they're filling the whole of the room. Um, and he was concerned that he was in this bed sit where the landlord was putting pressure on him to say that you're not allowed to create art in it. You just have to live in it. You, you couldn't use it as a studio. And he was concerned about that. So I said to him, I said, Charles, look, you know, you're 98. You've done it all your life. Just do it anyway. Not that he wasn't. He was going to do it. So then we get an opportunity to make this portrait together. And I was lucky enough to make a couple of portraits of him. But in this one, it was a beautiful experience because he kind of, you know, you just coalesce with the person. Um, and he was very generous in his way he kind of sat and engaging as well. He didn't move an inch when I was making his portrait. And he was very keen to see it. He said he'd had his portrait made by some London portrait painter the year before and when she made his portrait um she wouldn't show him <laughs> and he, he i took it he kind of took umbrage to that he thought what, what are you trying to hide you know until she'd gone away and then shown it later but he he wanted to be part of the creative process so the fact that we were doing this together we created it together that meant something for him and that kind of enabled the, the little sketch that i did to uh, get some of the kind of character of the man um, and with this little drawing and that black and white photograph, this is what he said that he wanted to be shared. So I thought, you know, to end this little presentation, sorry I've gone on a little bit, um, but these are these kinds of words, which I think are useful for, you know, all of us trying to be creative through all kinds of times. He said, I would like, I would say, do your own thing in life. If you have an idea, just do it. Don't be put off by other people. When I was young, I asked others what they thought of my work. If they didn't like it, I could be discouraged. As time passed, I continued with my own vision and became more confident. It's all right for all of us, isn't it? It is worthwhile to study and learn from the old and modern masters, but then go your own way. Do not be afraid to take risks. And as he said, while at Romley Primary School, I was lucky to have the headmaster, Mr. Peach, who encouraged his students in many different ways. Said, I remember being taken to trips to Stratford for Shakespeare. We were encouraged to play sports, including football and swimming. We were introduced to practical subjects, metalwork, and at the same time, I was part of a famous choir and orchestra, well now known throughout the UK. He created an environment of classical music, sport, and practical application. The experience of that big vision never left me. And it's that big vision that we're after when we look, we look at all these different presentations. Some will wash over us and others will just chime with. And that will give us that little door or that little window to de develop our work. Uh, sometimes when making a painting, a particular part can shine out. Now, for the sake of unity in the piece, it can be tempted to tone it down. But he says, I prefer to lift up 
all the other parts of the painting to support the part that shines out. Now that's the important line there. Get the best bit of your picture that works and try and get all the other bits to up to that level, you know. Um, that's the big challenge, but keep at it and we'll get there. Um, living the life of an artist and creating artwork can be isolating. Making a piece can include countless hours on your own. It's important to keep thinking big, enjoy what you do and keep a clear vision. And this is another interesting line. To be an artist in Wales, you need to be made of steel. Um, and, you know, that sums it up. You know, Charles's long, inspiring life. Um, and this is just a few little tips for our homework inspiration. Create your own jewel-like artwork or even your own little magical machine. Consider the view or the location, um, you know, the site that you're most drawn to, your perspective, your colour, tone and composition. You know, would you like to include a person in the piece for a narrative to tell those multiple stories? Think of the abstract nature of the composition. Don't be afraid to invent colours and move shapes, you know. If something you prefer to have a tree to the left or the right and you like it to be pink or red, go for it, you know, and move things around in your artwork. It's your magical world. Have some fun. And that's the idea of Charles. Have some fun. Enjoy being creative. There we are. That's a little insight for you on Charles and the wonderful world.